Hello again. Welcome to, welcome to another episode of Gong Ho, July 9, 2024. I have with me my good friend Jim Henry becoming a co-host with me. And we're going to tell you why Trump, why this guy who's nothing more than a, a TV a monster, Reality stuff, that's what he is. All right. I think we should start what happened with Felix Seder, and you could bring it together. All right? Yeah, well, this is a pretty important time uh, in U.S. history, obviously. We have uh, NATO meeting in Washington today, 100-degree heat. Three of the four key uh, NATO countries represented, France, Germany, and the United States, all have political leaders who are shaky. And Biden is giving a big speech this afternoon. Everybody's going to be watching because he's probably sh the shakiest of the group. Uh, we're on the verge of a Trump revival in which this guy who's been already convicted of one uh, serious felony and is uh, under indictment for three uh, other big criminal cases uh, may well be elected president for the second time. Uh, so one of the things we want to explore is how did this happen? You know, why are we on the verge of elected somebody who uh, in most other democracies would have been in jail by now? Not just for his political crimes, uh, his theft of documents, uh, his uh, uh, outrageous behavior on the 6th of January 2020 when he tried to overthrow the election, 2021. and. Uh, but uh, what we've explored in detail is his financial criminal history, how he came to resurrect his empire and even be, be in a position to run for president. Uh, as of the year 2000, he had had six bankruptcies. No U.S. bank would lend to him. And yet after that period, uh, he was revived financially and he came to uh, be in a position to run for president. In call himself a billionaire. Uh, the other analogy we hate to make here is the, the analogy of January 1933 in Germany, uh, when Adolf Hitler actually began, began to, to come to power uh, by virtue of the center-right in Germany. Uh, he didn't seize power. He proceeded through the electoral system, even though he only had a support of maybe 35 to 40 percent of the German people. Uh, he was able to convince the center-right uh, to make way for him in the system, and he went on to seize control, and as soon as he became chancellor uh, in 1934, uh, he uh, instituted a real dictatorship. So, you know, Trump has this plan, 2025, that's been certified by the Heritage Foundation, a right-wing think tank funded by oil billionaires. Uh, and it calls for nothing less than a full-blown dictatorship, uh, firing uh, thousands and thousands of civil servants, uh, reinstituting essentially martial law in the United States, going after his enemies, political enemies, and many journalists, uh, myself included. So this is very scary, and it's this time around, unlike Germany in the 30s, uh, the United States has nuclear weapons. We're a global power already. Uh, this would be very bad news for many democracies in the world that are already battling the forces of fascism. So uh, the question we're asking today is, what were the real crimes of Donald Trump that he managed to get away with? And I think in that respect, we have to go back to June 27th, uh, 2024, and look at a court case involving a fellow named Felix Sater. Uh, his father was Mikhail Shivaransky from uh, Moscow, came to the United States in 1966 when Felix was a youngster. Uh, Felix went on to become Donald Trump's main real estate investor in the 2000s and was critical in helping him uh, rebuild his financial empire. At the same time, Felix had pled guilty to uh, uh, a bunch of uh, 
racketeering conspiracy, racketeering conspiracy uh, charges related to stock fraud in the late uh, 1990s, 1998. And he was allowed to become a confidential informant for the FBI and the Justice Department at this critical period, just before he becomes Trump's key financial advisor uh, in New York. So from 2000 on, uh, through a company called Bayrock. And I don't expect you to memorize all the details here. It's an extraordinary, complicated case. But there's a number of articles, if you're interested, you can find online. Sater goes on to help Trump, out, Trump finance uh, the Trump Soho uh, with hundreds of millions of dollars that came from offshore sources. Uh, he goes on to launder a lot of money for uh, uh, Kazakhstan kleptocrats. Kazakhstan is a very rich oil country in Central Asia. Uh, and uh, Sater and Rudy Giuliani uh, were basically involved in ripping off a big bank uh, from Kazakhstan and laundering the money and sending it into the Trump Soho as recently as 2013-2014. Keep your eyes on me. <laughs> so the issue here is that uh, for, for whatever reason, the Justice Department never prosecuted Felix Sater for these financial crimes, never prosecuted Rudy Giuliani, uh, and they never prosecuted Donald Trump for clear-cut examples of money laundering, right. financial fraud. Everything you're saying about yeah. Felix Sater, we have proof of this. Absolutely. Because uh, when mm -hmm. Felix Sater was busted by the FBI in... Uh, 1998 is something he had done in uh, probably 94, 95, 96. He formed this illegal brokerage with mafioso, both Italian and Russian. He did this, and uh, he went to, after he did this, he went to Russia, and he did something really stupid. He took all the financial documents, he put it in a locker, didn't pay the rent, the landlord opened a locker, looked at it, called the police. The police came, they called the FBI, and they realized this is important. They actually reached out to say and said, you better come back. He came back, he played guilty to racketeering conspiracy. How do I know all of this? Because the case that he made, that he helped the feds make, I was one of the defense lawyers, one of the mafioso. I was representing Danny Persico Jr. So... Everything comes together, and everything we're saying, we have proof of it. It's not like we, we, I'm, we're telling you secondhand uh, what Seder did. He took the plea, racketeering conspiracy, the $44 million in 1998, and in his own words, after he took the plea in 2000, he went over to the Trump Tower and joined Bayrock, took it over, and started doing business with the Trump Organization. Felix Ada has been around for over two decades, and it was only recently that he was found responsible for laundering stolen money and the money going into Trump real estate projects. This is a big story. The connection is money. Hundreds of millions of dollars came from foreign nations, mostly Russia and Kazakhstan, and they wound up through all these offshore accounts, right? And they wound up here. Yeah. That's, well, we, and we that's, had, uh, that's the connection between Putin. None of that would have happened unless Putin said you could do it. Yeah, none of the garks that were involved in this, uh, and certainly uh, you know, the uh, sources of money that came into uh, the Trump properties, uh, would have moved an inch without uh, Putin's involvement and say so. And uh, that's the, the, the background. So, uh, the interference of Russia was not in, they, to some extent, they interfered in the 2016 election when uh, Hillary Clinton ran against Trump. But the key intervention was providing the financial yeah. wherewithal that recreated his and, uh, empire. And when Mueller came in in 2017, he specifically did not investigate Trump's financials. I heard him say this. Yeah, no, he, he and his... Uh, you know, a lot of the people around Mueller, um, Andrew Weissman, for example, a professor at NYU now, but, uh, you know, he was involved in giving Sater the original confidential informant status. 
Uh, he and Loretta Lynch, another a Democrat who became Attorney General, they were both in the EDNY in 1998. Uh, they were involved in granting Seder that status and then keeping it a, a secret um, so that when uh, Seder went out to raise money for investors to invest in the Trump Soho around 2007, uh, they did not inform these investors that uh, uh, Seder was a twice convicted felon. And then he went to, in 2009, uh, before Judge Glasser in the Eastern District, uh, he did a sweetheart uh, a uh, plea deal in which he got and off with a twenty-five thousand dollar fine, yeah, and he got off with a seventy million dollar yeah. uh, forgiveness it was more of restitution. Than a sweetheart deal. They committed crimes. The judge, the prosecutor, say his lawyer at that time was Leslie Cordwell, who would go on to become the number three person in the Justice Department. They committed crimes. They avoid. They just uh, just ignored. The Mandatory Victim Restitution Act, which was passed by Congress. When the government arrests a, a, a guy that's such a big fraudster, the law says you have to notify the people that he stole from. The government never did that in this case. That's right. Well, I mean, Sater was a financial whitey bulger. He basically was profiting from his relationships with the FBI and the Justice Department, using them as cover that allowed him to go off and make money and continue to launder money throughout uh, the most recent period. So this latest lawsuit was very important because it, uh, in June we just got confirmation. Sater lost his lawsuit. He was sued by the bank uh, that he ripped off and they have a $32 million judgment against him. But the key thing that's interesting about this lawsuit is it leaves out any mention of Rudy Giuliani, who is the president's attorney, who was directly involved in setting up all the companies that Seder used in the Netherlands to launder this money. And it doesn't uh, make any reference uh, to Donald Trump's awareness or involvement to this. It, it acts as if, even though he had met uh, the kleptocrats involved uh, he, uh, and, and discussed their investments in the Trump Soho, somehow he was not involved in this conspiracy. So. We think the reason that Mueller decided not to go after Sater uh, and some of his associates financials. and not to go after Giuliani because they had made this decision, this, this uh, mistake to give Sater secret status as a confidential informant. They didn't want that known. They didn't want to know that he had had a person within the Trump organization uh, for 20 years. Um, I, I practiced law for over 40 years. I was admitted to the Eastern District of New York in 1975 and the Southern District of New York. I had never represented a cooperating witness. So all these things that I'm finding out about SEDA, this is all new to me. Uh, what the government does, they'll take a very bad person and he'll plead guilty and they send them out. And that very bad person, they think is going to get someone even worse. And they let the, the, their informer now commit crimes. They have a term for it called otherwise illegal activity. So Seda went out and committed financial crimes while he was the government informer and way before he was sentenced. It's like that guy, uh, Bolger. He's an FBI informant, and, he, and while he's an informant, he goes out and he murders people, he extorts people, he robs, and otherwise illegal activity, he gets a pass. That's exactly what Dunn Dun would say to yeah. All right. We suspect, actually, that there are more examples of Felix Sater type confidential informant deals that were made specifically in the Eastern District of New York. There's and, probably, there's probably and a thousand people. You can only, I mean, it... It warrants, if we had a Congress uh, that would investigate these things, it certainly warrants a, a close look at the federal judiciary because we're seeing case after case of abuse uh, of this status of confidential so, informant. A lot of people say when you do an investigation, follow the money. Mueller, no. Didn't do anything about the financials. He absolutely knew about it. And so that, to me was a setup. Mueller 
being designated the special counsel to go after Trump and his connections to the Russians. That was the deal was we're not going to do that. He's gonna, we're going to protect Trump because of what we already did with our informer. And what, that's what happened. It wasn't only Felix Sater that was financing Trump. There was also a guy named Dmitry Rivolovlov who provided money to buy uh, Trump's Miami property in uh, June of uh, 2008 at a critical time. He paid uh, Trump uh, $40 million more for a property in Miami than it was worth at a time that Trump was again about to go bankrupt once more. Uh, and he needed the $40 million. 40 pay, million to, more than it was worth. More, more than it was worth. Uh, uh, and uh, Ribolovlov then goes on and, and, you know, he buys part of the Bank of Cyprus where Wilbur Ross was a uh, chairman uh, in, in 2013. Uh, he's involved in 2016. His Airbus 319 has been tracked to land at the same airports that uh, Trump is involved. So, you know, uh, nobody ever investigated Rivolovlov. Um, today, he, uh, you know, is a, a, a multi-billionaire. But, uh, you know, another example is Deutsche Bank, which provided a lot of loans to Donald Trump. He was close to, uh, close to Moscow. At, uh, longtime chairman was so the was, connection is so, so there's the a connection. number of different conduits yeah. but all of this theme song about the Russians basically helping to finance the creation of Donald Trump now why would they do that so Felix Sater was the Russian connection as far as getting money from Russia and other foreign nations and Trump is really the Russian candidate he is the Russian candidate. Well, he certainly is uh, expressed, you know, his admiration for Vladimir Putin. He's made it clear that he wants the United States uh, out of NATO, uh, that uh, the Ukraine, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, you know, can't count on U.S. support. He's been complaining about how much money we've spent there. I mean, if the Ukraine is occupied uh, by, by Russia, by Putin, uh, you know, Poland and uh, uh, Germany are, are going to have to defend themselves. So I think that, you know, there's no doubt that uh, Putin is celebrating Trump's revival here. And it's, it's very important for Americans to realize just what's at stake here from the standpoint of U.S. national security uh, in this election. Trump is probably the most serious or dangerous, ever threat to our national security, meaning our constitutional democracy. This is worse than ever. This well, is I, I, I think that now he's on the verge because of Biden's uh, condition and his reluctance to step aside. Uh, you know, he's being normalized. I mean, in that so-called debate that we had, the media basically uh, did not take on or challenge Trump's now, yeah. many misstatements about you know. It's it's amazing to me that he's running for office. Um, there are states out there that say he's ineligible, and our Supreme Court comes back and says, no, he's eligible, even though he's convicted 34 times of felonies, and even though we watched him try to overturn the government, he's eligible to run for, our, for the presidency. Not only that, but they've expanded the immunity. Uh, this recent decision in the Supreme Court has given... Uh, the, the president, uh, a kind of but the uh, Supreme Court, impunity yeah. for, oh for God, official oh decisions. So, you know. Uh, what, what they have done, look, I knew, because well, you know, I was in the system, state and federal, that there was corruption. I didn't know how bad it was. Uh, it was worse than I thought it was because it's systemic corruption. And it's in the FBI, it's in the Department of Justice, but the federal judges. And if, it's, if they know what's going on, people in a higher office, like the attorney general and the presidents, they know these things. And they won't say anything about it because it will hurt so many people, including Democrats and Republicans, what really goes on. So, uh, with the Supreme Court decision, everything, but oh, the Supreme Court. People, like, are giving them, you know, a reverence uh, 
authority, worship, because they're the Supreme Court. They're just people, and they're subject to being criminals. That's six. They are criminals. Why? Because they did something that has never done before. They granted what they thought they had the power to grant immunity to the president. They don't have that power. They give him power to do things, to use like the FBI to persecute his enemies, to use the military to quell domestic, uh, uh, domestic uprisings or even gatherings, whatever. That, that's, that's all beyond the Constitution. So they're acted unconstitutionally. They are trying to, they're attempting to insert, do an insurrection against their own government. And they're going to get, they're getting away with it so far. What about Smedley Butler? I managed to tell people oh. about that example. <laughs> Just as a, there is a precedent for this. All right, listen, for when, I was in boot, yeah, when I was in boot camp, yeah. Paris Island, uh, we were training really hard. And they gave us a rifle, it was an M14, a great rifle. And that, we were 24 seven with that rifle. When we jumped into our racks at night, the rifle was right there. But the last thing we said before lights out was, good night, Smedley Butler, wherever you are. <laughs> lights out. Now we were told Smedley Butler was the most decorated Marine ever. He was. But after he got out of the Marine Corps, he wrote a book called War is a Racket, and what he said basically that most of the time, except for the World War I, he was a gangster and he was, you know, out there uh, furthering the interests of big money in foreign countries, our big money. Now, in, about, in 1933, a group, a group of very rich Republicans got together and they were going to have a coup. They were going to overthrow our democratic government. But and they went, they went to Smedley Butler because Smedley Butler was so famous amongst the veterans and they wanted him to organize the veterans to support the coup. So what did he do? He dropped a dime on them. He said, <laughs> you know, these guys, you had the names, with the, and right. this is what they're doing. The Mellon family. Uh... They had, and they had a congressional hearing. Yep. They had a hearing. I have the minutes. Smedley Butler testified, and other people testified, and the decision of the hearing examiners, whatever, Congress, Smedley's right. These people are trying to, you know, take me. And, and guess which uh, Mellon is supporting Trump? You know, there's a whole tradition here of uh, the sort of right-wing well, aristocratic. We tend to blame Trump on, you know, ordinary working people. Uh, but uh, there's a heck of a lot of very, very wealthy people who are supporting this well, guy and yes, hoping to I profit from him. Yeah. The bottom line is the, the Congressional Committee said he's right. These rich people were going to execute a coup, take over the government. He's right. Mm -hmm. the, the committee never called any of those rich people. They got a pass, and that was the end of it. Nobody was held accountable. Nobody was prosecuted for a Get it, organizing a coup, a conspiracy to overthrow the government. Yeah. Well, let's come back to the central point. This is a critical election. People have to understand what's at stake. And if you just Google Project 2025, you'll see the recipe for dictatorship that Donald Trump will follow if he takes office. He's going to have control of the Supreme Court. He'll also have control, possibly, of the Senate, maybe of the House of Representatives. Uh, he will have basically no checks and balances, even apart from this latest uh, Supreme Court decision that gave him virtual immunity for any crimes he commits while in office. Uh, so it's a very perilous time, but we've been through perilous times before. Uh, my family's been here since 1790s. And uh, we're not going anywhere. Um, you know, we're not thinking, I don't know what's going on with Biden. In uh, 1776, we declared our independence against a king, against a tyrant. We won. And we got our democracy from our Constitution. We did this one time before. 
We had to struggle. It was serious. It's happening again. Our, our president right now is a monarch. Biden is a monarch. He's not using uh, the powers that the Supreme Court has, uh, says he has. Because if he did, he'd only be corroborating what they're saying. What they're saying is absolute bullshit. It has, it's void. They, they cannot give to the executive powers that they don't have. They're giving these powers to the president. They can't do that. They, they don't have it. But they, you know, and we're accepting it. And I'm saying, no, I don't accept that. I think they're, they're enemies, they're domestic enemies. Do you think Biden should step yes. aside? Step aside? No, no. He should do what I'm telling you right now. Say to them, the Supreme Court, you are criminals. Mm. You're trying to undermine our democracy by undermining our Constitution. You are criminals. I want you to step down. You don't step down. I'll take you down. Mm. I'm going to refer this down to the Department of Justice. This what you did is you com or you're attempting to you know, turn, overturn our government. You well, already you, did it. You could probably enlarge the court. That's one practical thing he could do if he had the support of Congress. But he doesn't have the support of Congress. So that's the problem that Biden has. There's not much he can actually do legally he, to override could, the court. He, look, you know, he that, could say what is apparent. He can denounce the court. Yes, call them out. Shame them. Well, say, he should be, yeah. he should be not saying a lot but of things. Shame them. You, yeah. took, you pledged. Yeah to defend the Constitution against foreign and domestic enemies. Yeah. You violated that pledge. Well, that's a crime. It's called insurrection. That's how he has to speak to them. Step down. You don't want to step down? I'll take you down. Well, a lot of Democrats are circling the wagons here defending Biden. I don't think Nobody Biden... Nobody talks... I don't think Biden is making the case for effectively. No, of course yeah. he's not. I want him... I mean, there's plenty of leading... You know what the reason is? The people around him are giving him bad advice. How could he not fight back against Trump and say these things against the court? They're self-evident things. I mean, he's, Trump could be the worst candidate ever to run for presidency. He doesn't have the demeanor, the character, the experience, really, to run our nation, to be our commander-in-chief. It's a joke. All right, we're over. I saw a familiar face walking on the avenue. Both surprised by the way we looked, these had changed us too. We smiled.